Good afternoon and welcome to our spring 2021 Redbird Educator Series. I'm Deborah McBee, Director of the Borg Center for Reading and Literacy, and Molly Davis from the College of Education is controlling things behind the scenes today. Thank you for being here. We are excited to kick off the spring series with Dr. Shamane Bertrand, who will talk today about teaching in the times of COVID-19, racial injustice and inequities. Before I introduce Dr. Bertrand, I'll provide a quick outline for our hour together. We're set up in a traditional webinar style. Dr. Bertrand will provide a 40 to 45 minute presentation during which we encourage you to use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to post comments and questions and to engage with each other around the ideas and strategies shared during the presentation. I will monitor the chat and rejoin the meeting following the presentation for a Q&A with Dr. Bertrand. Now let's get started. We are thrilled to have with us today, Dr. Charmaine Bertrand. Dr. Bertrand is an activist, educator, and advocate who strives every day to help center blackness in education, addressing issues of race and racism, class, and inequities in education. She supports both pre-service and in-service teachers in doing the self-work required to make sure they, are all, they all show up in ways that students need them to. She is an assistant professor of elementary education in the School of Teaching and Learning at Illinois State University. While at ISU, Dr. Bertrand co-founded the Equity and Diversity Cohort and became the PDS liaison for two local public school districts. In addition to her roles at ISU, she is the co-creator and co-host of the Black Gaze podcast and an educational consultant for schools and school districts across the United States. Dr. Bertrand holds a PhD in multilingual multicultural education with a concentration in education policy, a master's degree in elementary education, and a bachelor's degree in parks, recreation, tourism management with a concentration in sports management and a minor in business management. Dr. Bertrand's research critically examines how to best prepare teacher candidates to effectively teach black and brown students. In addition, she focuses on how best to create racially equitable learning environments and educational spaces of liberation and healing for black and brown students. It has always been her passion and calling to serve her community and help school faculty and staff create racially equitable learning environments. Dr. Bertrand. Well, hello everyone. As Deb was reading this, I promise, I was like, who's she talking about? This is, oh, I wanna hear more, but um, it's me. <laughs> so I would just like to welcome you all to this webinar, um, Teaching in the Times of COVID-19, Racial Injustice and Inequities. But I like, I can't see you, you can see me. I would like to know who is in this space. So in the chat, if you could, we're gonna do like a roll call. If you could tell me your name and where you're from, that would be so amazing. So just use the chat feature. And if you could just light it up with, I guess just like shout out to where you're from and that to help me see who you are. And I'm gonna give you a second to do that. Tuscola. Oh, it's so nice to meet all of you. I love this. Okay, so just so while we're getting started and everybody's introducing themselves, I do not mind if you use the chat. I'm not gonna be looking at the chat. Dr. McPhee will be probably looking at the chat. Um, Molly will probably be looking at the chat, but I won't because it'll throw me off because then I'll start trying to chat with y'all. So it is so amazing to see you all from all over the place from Chicago all the way to normal to places that I can't even pronounce and I'm not going to try to pronounce, but welcome. And so we are going to get um, started in Decatur. I used to have a partnership there. All right, so we're going to get started, my friends. So the first thing I want to do is I want to um, acknowledge the land that many of you are webinar zooming in from. Um, in normal, I want to highlight that and pay my respects to the Kickapoo, the Peoria, the Kaskaskia, and the Miamia tribes. And the reason why this is so important is because we have to acknowledge that this land is stolen land and it's not the land that belongs to us. And so I'm grateful for this opportunity to present um, here in this space on this sacred land. 
And so that's something that I always um, want to recognize because I think it is an honor and a privilege to be able to be in this space right now. And so I start all of my presentations um, acknowledging those who have paved the way for me. And usually it's one or two people. But when I started to think about the topic that we're covering today, and we're talking about teaching and equity, we're talking about teaching and racial injustice, and um, also through this COVID-19 thing, I had to really think about my support group. And usually, I don't know if you all have listened to the Black Gays podcast or not, but we always have this segment called Honoring the OGs. And usually, um, I use like scholars that have supported me or the person that's given me the idea. But when I think about today and the conversations we're going to have, it was like a great multitude of people. And so I have friends, I have family, I have faculty members, um, I have professors that I've had in the past here. And I just want to honor that for me to be in this space and for me to do the work that I'm doing, that I did not get here by myself. And so as you all are listening to me today, I want you to recognize too that this work um, it cannot be done. And I, I was thinking about whether or not I should say it or not, but it cannot be done in isolation. You have to have a community. You have to have people um, that will support you through this work and that you also have to have to remember from whence you have come. Um, and so that is why I honor and I call them my OGs. No, I'm not a gang banger, but I do call them my original gangsters. And none of them are no gangs that I know of, but I just wanted to honor them in, in this space that um, we have created. And so today's agenda, um, we are going to start off with an identity check. I do not believe that this work can be done without us first looking at ourselves. And shout out to Dr. Yolanda Seeley Ruiz, who talks about the archaeology of self. Anytime that we are in this in a space of doing critical, having critical conversations, or if we're thinking about race, if we're thinking about um, any form of inequities or oppression, we have to really start with ourselves. And so I, I'm going to pose the question, who do you think you are? And I'm not saying it like to insult you, um, but I, we're going to dig into that. And then we're going to talk about racial injustice, COVID-19, and the inequities in schools. And as I was preparing for this, James Baldwin came into my mindset and I started to think about a talk to teachers that he um, that he did in October 1963. And so I am going to talk about that a little bit. We're gonna be talking about teaching all students. And really what does that mean when we say that? Co-constructing an equitable learning environment and space for students. And then we're gonna end with a challenge about freedom, healing and love in the classroom. The reason why I have this treat is because I was really thinking through this thing now. This, this presentation, believe it or not, has stressed my whole life because I was like, what am I going to share with these people? But here's the deal. Um, the tree represents a lot of times we don't want to get to the root of things. We don't want to, you know, we want everything to flourish and we want to look at it at the top where everything's sprouting out. The branches are good. The leaves are flourishing. Like it's a beautiful situation. But really today is about looking at the root. What is it that is what is creating problems and then how can we how can we develop skills and strategies and things to overcome the place that we're in and so i am going to move forward and again in order to get anything from this webinar we must start with our own identity and so i have a couple of questions that i'm posing to you all and i really want you to think about this and and, and of course it's a webinar so you don't have to respond but you can jot some of these down um, you can reflect on them right now. I'll be like, dang, I ain't never think about that. Who are you? And when I say that, I know that's like a loaded question because some of you can instantly be like, well, for me, I would be like, I'm Charmaine. Yes, honey, I was, you know, raised in Lumberton, North Carolina. I'm a professor here at Illinois State. Like we can give all of these different roles and responsibilities. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm a cousin, I'm an aunt. Like I can give all of these different roles, but when we really tap into our heart, who are we? And the reason why I want us to think about that is because that sets us up for how we see ourselves. And how we see ourselves is very important because a lot of times the way that we see ourselves is sometimes how people don't perceive us or they may perceive us the way that we see ourselves, but we never know because we don't spend time to, to sit down and think about it. And one of the things, COVID has been a hot mess, but one of the things that COVID has allowed me to do is to really sit in a space with myself and try to figure out like, Girl, who are you? And what is it about you? And to be honest, I love me. Like I always tell people, if I had a best friend, it would be me. But at the same time, I got some mess with me. And so COVID allowed me to really deal with some of those things. 
then I want you to think about not only how do you see yourself, but then how do your how does your family see you? How does your community see you? And the reason why these three questions are important is because who we are at home has to align with who we are outside of home. And sometimes it doesn't work like that. And specifically when we're talking about inequities, that's what I really want us to be thinking about, right? So I can't make racist comments at home or I can't make sexist comments or homophobic comments at home and then turn up at work and be like, oh yes, let's fight the power. So I really have to deal with who I am. And so that's why I raise those questions. And then also how does your community see you? Because that's also important. And we're gonna talk about this cycle of socialization in a minute because a lot of times we don't realize it, but what's happening outside really impacts how we see things and how we deal with things. And so then how do your students see you? And if you are an administrator, how does your teachers and your students see you? Because you got another layer, right? How do you want to be seen? What do you need to do in order to be seen the way that you want to be seen? And so those are just things that I'm throwing out there for you all, because I want you to really be thoughtful and critical about this journey that we're about to take and really think about yourself. Because I realize sometimes when we have conversations and I call this a critical conversation and we're talking about inequities, we're talking about um, racial injustice or we're talking about even now COVID. Uh, it's always like, uh, nope, that's not my issue. That's that person. Or no, I ain't got that problem. Mm -mm, I don't have that. And so I really want us to sit with that. And so one of the things that I want to share with you all is this cycle of socialization. And so what this cycle of socialization is, it's something that I use a lot and I love it. Shout out to Dr. Keisha Porcher for sharing this with me. But in the beginning, when we all are born, we are pretty much blank slates, right? We are born into this world. We don't have any bias. We don't have any stereotypes. We don't have any blame, there's no consciousness, there's nothing. And so then what begins to happen is we go home, whether we go home to our parents or whether we go home to a guardian or a foster care or wherever we go, then we're starting to learn ways that people have. And so one of the easiest things is when you're in a hospital, if you're born and you, they identify you as a girl, then you get pink stuff and you get blue stuff. But then now when you're at home, you continue those gender norms, but then there's also this um, idea of expectation. Okay, what does it mean to trust this group? Or what does it mean to love? And you get all these extra things. And then as you develop and you go outside of the home, you start to have this institutional and culture um, socialization that happens. Believe it or not, and research is um, actually very much so proven this, that a lot of the biases and stereotypes and images that we carry about people, they come from media. So you're watching TV and you're getting information about certain groups, or you go to school and you get information about certain groups, you go to church or whatever have you. And so you start to develop these ideologies or these thoughts about different groups of people. And so then what happens is you, you start to decide, like you get to a space where you're like, okay, this group of people, mm, they're not that great. My group of people, we're kind of like this. So you start to decide on how you see different groups and how you see different people. And so then what happens is it results in you having an opinion. It develops your bias. It develops how you see people, see groups of people around you, see different organizations. And so not to say that this is always right, because sometimes it's not. This is where we become who we are. But we have to make a decision once we realize that we picked up all of this. And it's kind of like breathing in smog. We have to make a decision on, am I going to, even if I know that what I was taught was wrong, am I going to continue to go in that direction? Or am I going to make some changes? Am I going to challenge the status quo? Am I going to raise my consciousness? Am I going to educate myself and do something different, even if it's not popular? And so this cycle of socialization really teaches us where we start and how we develop, but then also it helps us to understand the choices that we make. But one thing I love about this cycle that Bobby Harrell created is that there's a room for disruption. And so today is that we're in this space of disruption. And so I want us to really think about just who we are as individuals and everything that we're taking in in this webinar, make it personal, make it about you, make it about what you are going to do, um, whether it's something different or some things that you're just going to think about. And so I love this um, James Baldwin quote. You can tell I'm on this. I had a James Baldwin vibe when I was putting this together, but I love this quote and it reads, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. 
And as teachers, I want us to really be our educators and whoever all is on here. Um, I really want us to be mindful of that. People really can't believe what you say if they see what you do. And this is not, some of y'all got it going on, honey. Some of y'all don't need this webinar and you sure don't need James Baldwin quoting those stuff to you. But I really want you to think about that because as, as we move forward from this day on in our roles, I really want us to be conscious that one, people are watching us. And it's in the people that watch us are the people who are most important, which is our students, right? They're watching us and they're looking at the moves that we make and the things that we're doing. And we can sit here and say, you know what, Black Lives Matter, or we take pride in, you know, just making sure that people can love, love is love. We can say all these things, but if our actions don't support it, then it doesn't matter. And so I want us to be mindful of that. So let's jump in. Teaching in the times of racial injustice, COVID and inequities. Now, yo, I told you we had to go to the root first. So the root starts with us. And this is still part of the root because we have to have an understanding of what is happening. And so I want you to look at these images that I have up here. And there were thousands of images to choose from. But I want you to look at the images. And here's the thing about this that's really crazy. As I was looking at this, I was like, oh my goodness, this is not the 60s. This was 2020. All, all of these were taken in 2020. Now, of course, they weren't taken by me, honey. I didn't went to the internet. But these are still photos that were taken in 2020 to capture the racial injustice that had just been happening, which has happened for 400 plus years. However, I don't know, all hell broke loose in 2020 and people was just doing what they wanted to do. And so that is something that I want you to think about now that you've taken in those images. Students saw that. Your kids, whether they were in kindergarten, preschool, or whether they are in high school or in college, we all witnessed the racial injustice that has taken place over the past umpteen years, but specifically in 2020. 2020 was just like, a, everybody, let's go wild, right? And so students watched the news and they witnessed, and maybe they even were on the internet and they witnessed the murders of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery. Tony McDade, George Floyd, Rayshard Brooks, and there's so many others. Like I would be here all day trying to, to list all the people who have died because of state sanctioned violence. And so here's the thing, protests took place. And the wonderful thing is, I think that the beauty of this this time was that it just wasn't like in the 60s where you saw predominantly black people marching and protesting. It was a worldwide event. I remember seeing like in Paris a protest where they were saying Black Lives Matter. I remember seeing in London, like it was a different vibe this time. And there were people in the, uh, the United States who were not just black, like so many people stood in solidarity against racial injustice this time around. And our students saw that as well. And then because of this, Students experience trauma. They experience anxiety. They experience depression. And this was multiple groups of students. But I specifically want to talk about the students who were who were at target at this point, right? And specifically our black students, but then our brown students. And when I use the term black, I'm talking about African American. And when I'm using the term brown, while there are many different racial and ethnic groups that might can fit into there, I'm specifically talking about the Latinx group. Okay. So they witnessed this, they felt this, and they didn't know how to articulate it. Students questioned their purpose. They questioned their existence. Even recently, within the last three weeks, they, they experienced an insurrection on January 6th at the Capitol, at the U.S. Capitol, okay? So th this is all happening right now. And while you all are probably like, well, why is that racial injustice? Why is it not? Let me pose that question, right? And so as educators, you all have experiences. I remember back in March, I, I was sitting with my students and these are my college students and I was emailing them. Like we were trying to figure out like how are we gonna do this, this school thing with this abrupt disruption because the ISU students went on spring break and then it, boom, COVID hit so they couldn't come back. It was just a hot mess, okay? And so I'm really sitting here with them and, and I was realizing like they were in panic and I'm trying to support them, but it hit me like, wait a minute, you're going through the same thing. And so I had to tell them like, you're going through a pandemic and you don't know if it's the end of the world because you know, child, people think it's apocalypse for anything. So I was like, I'm going through this same thing that you're going through. And so as teachers, you experience the same racial injustice. And so what, what does that feel like for you, right? And so COVID-19, going into where we were in March and it's still here. And now there's new strand that they say, right? And so that was impacting, that was impacting our students. And so with that, students lost loved ones. 
They were fearful of the effects of COVID-19. They experienced anxiety. I don't think any of us, now I could be lying and you could tell me in the chat, but I don't think any of us stayed in our house this long. Like I started to like do puzzles. You know, you start doing stuff that you never, I was like chef boy RD, okay? I was really up in there whipping up some food. Like I was trying to do things to buy my time, but it just seemed like the days were so long. So I started to have anxiety because I'm just sitting in the house. And I mean, let's not be, let's be honest. Even if we wanted to do a drive around, I don't know, many of you are from different places, but in normal, we are a corn and soybean hub. So it really won't nothing to drive around and see. So we was really just stuck in the house and looking at the corn as it grows, right? Students, their normal was impacted. Some were supposed to graduate and have this beautiful graduation party. Some were going to the prom. Some were, you know, graduate from kindergarten, just little things that was impacted by them. Teachers experience this too. And so these are things that I really wanted to highlight in this presentation. And I want you all to pause and I want you to think about what are you doing to process what you have experienced or are still experiencing? Because I don't want to count it out. And then what are educators doing to, to process this and to help students process what they experience and are still experiencing? What can educators do? So this is for, so I'm assuming that some people did something, but then I'm also assuming that some people ain't did nothing now. So what can educators do to help students process what they experience and are still experiencing? And what do educators need to do to help students process what they experience and are still experiencing? And so these are things just to think about as we think about the times that we're in. And is there a perfect answer? No, I'm gonna share some strategies with you today. And honey, this is just like uh, take it and leave it. You can either, you can take it or you can leave it. It's completely up to you, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you some things that, that I've been working with. And so we talked about COVID for a little bit. We talked about racial injustice. I'm setting this up. We at the root still. And so I wanna hit on inequities. And a lot of times when people talk about anything that deals with equity, this is the first image that they want to show. And I am not a hater. I'm not. There's actually a piece on this. And it talks about how the equity image um, perpetuates white supremacy. I think it's something like that. It's on medium.com. There's an article on this. And so when we look at this, it's really interesting because I see this all the time when equity is part of a conversation. But the thing that I always challenge is, okay, yes. We took a crate from the father or the man, the, the gentleman, and we gave it to the, to the youngest child. So now they can see over the fence, right? But my question is, if we're talking about equity, why is the fence there? Why do, why do we even have to have, why is there this barrier, right? Why is it, what are the systems that have caused the inequity in the beginning? in the first place where everybody can't see. And so those are the things that the critical questions that I want you all to, to ask as you are, um, as you're watching this, because a lot of times we just go with what we, you know, like, yeah, yes, yeah, it's equity. And it's an inequity when you just got to throw something at somebody. People don't need you throwing nothing at them. We need to examine the system so that it doesn't occur over and over and over again. And that's what it is. You, it's kind of like, I know this is going to be graphic, but it's kind of like putting a Band-Aid over a gunshot wound. We got to tend to the real issue. And so that's what we're going to do here. So let's talk about inequities in school. I have um, a couple that just came to my mind as I was working on this presentation. One being funding, okay? A lot of times, and many of you are from different places in Illinois, and I'm not trying to be funny because again, I've only, oh, I don't know if I told you this or is Dave Brady, but I've only been here for four years. So I don't even know, honestly, when you're saying you from this place and that place, I'm like, I don't know where those places are. I know where normal is, but here's the thing. I do know that some districts are given more funding than other districts. I do know that uh, some districts are using funding to, for the betterment of schools and other districts are suffering. And I can tell you that because I've been in situations where I've taken pre-service teachers into schools and I'm like, what in the heck? It was literally a scene out of Jonathan Kozel's book, Savage Inequities. I, it was just crazy for me. And that might not be the name of the book, but I think it is. And so I really want us to know that funding comes with its own inequities. I saw, I have seen teachers using construction paper to create bulletin boards in their class, in their, in their hallway where I've gone to other schools and I've seen teachers have like the rollout paper. And I know it sounds like something simple, but it's really, it's a, it's an issue. Okay. And so access to technology. One of the things that COVID-19 has done is it has really given us a, a heightened uh, look at the digital divide. 
it has not only heightened the digital, you know, the digital divide that existed, but it also has taught us about the inequities that have existed in certain communities for forever. And it just took COVID to put a microscope on that. Um, there's a lack of high speed internet, especially when we talk about rural spaces, one to one technology. A lot of districts had to go in and start ordering all of these little tablets and computer things for the students to have. And then technology integration training for teachers. A lot of times there's this expectation that, you know, okay, you got a laptop. Okay, what's the difference? What's the good of having a laptop or some type of device if there's nobody teaching you how to use it? That's an inequity, right? And so also with this, there's that lack of effective educational and learning experiences for teachers to understand and respond to students' needs. And this is something that I want to talk about because I was doing um, some professional development work for a school district, and we were just having a general conversation as we were planning things. And I was like, you know what, this honestly is my first time ever thinking about it, but teacher education programs don't do really a lot of, like, we don't centrally go into equity work like we don't think about it from like race and equity and da, 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 da. so we have a lot of teachers who have never had anti-racism um coursework or they've never had conversations about equity and race and other topics in their class and so that's a disservice another thing to think about is racial bias towards black girls and i was reading um georgetown law center of poverty wrote a report and they talked about the adultification of bias and how black young ladies are taught are treated as if they're adults in schools. That's an inequity. Um, same thing for black boys. They're looked at being violent. When you look at disproportionality in school discipline, take time when you have it and look at your school district's disproportionality and, and, and look at your school district's discipline rates. Like look at who gets pushed out. And I don't say drop people drop out because I don't think that they choose to, to leave school. I think we push them out because we don't want to deal with them. Lower percentages of black and brown students refer to gifted um, programs. And I want to show this, um, these percentages because one of the things that really is interesting is that there's been a shift in the type of kids that come to school now. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, but Push Out by Monique Morris, amazing book. Yesterday I was watching TMZ, don't judge me. And when I was watching TMZ, Harvey, Harvey showed a um, clip of Osceola, Florida, where a black girl was slammed by one of the school resource officers. All of that's in push out. I like this quote by Jonathan Kozel, and I mentioned him earlier. After all these years, America still runs a separate and unequal school system. Inequity still exists. I am a patriot, a uh, patriot person. Like, I don't want y'all to be like, she's not patriotic. I am, but I tell the truth and shame the devil. If you can't change reality, change the perceptions of it. Audre Lorde. So I wanted to bring us to reality. So now we can start to change the way we see things and now we can do the work to make it better, okay? So remember I was telling you, I'm thinking about this talk and I even use this with my pre-service teachers. A talk to teachers by James Baldwin in October, 1963. I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you but this is something that I need for you all to get um, and put your hands on it and read it. It is so crazy because in 1963, they were having the same conversations that we're having right now in 2021. Unbelievable. And so the thing that gets me is, let's begin by saying that we are living through a very dangerous time. Everyone in this room is one way or another aware of that. That just resonated with me because I believe that. I truly, truly believe that. And so I just wanted to leave that there. It's a beautiful, beautiful reading. Um, so many salient points. And I wanted to leave that there because I wanted to share just a resource that I want you all to go into. Now, I want to do a post check. I'm going to bring up this chat. How are y'all feeling? We're about to get into the strategies, I promise. But the prob I think the problem is we live in such a microwave society. People want the checklist and the strategies, baby. We need them right now. We need them right now. And we need to get to the root of these issues first, right? And so how y'all feeling? Y'all feeling, I think this is Leonardo DiCaprio, little cutie. Cheers, feeling like I am at the right webinar and I'm fine. So if you're feeling cheers, put cheers in the chat. You feeling like Cardi B? This is so much and I have to really sit with my thoughts and process, but I'm here for it. Or do you feel like Chrissy Teigen? Yikes. This is seriously a reality check and not sure if I'm ready. 
So in the chat, tell me, are you Christy? Are you um, Cheers? Are you Cardi B? And I, okay, so it was late last night and I'm sitting here putting these images together. Let me see. Come on, Cheers. And if you're not a Cheers, that's okay. You can be Cardi. I love this. Yes. And it's okay because if you're Cardi, I'm going to get you equipped and y'all are going to be all right. I love this. Okay. All right. We are going to move on because look, I only got y'all for an hour. I'm not trying to take all the, the time. Oh, yes. But can I just shout out one of the things that's in this chat? There is a shortage of Black men in both leadership and teaching positions on all levels of education. And I hear what you are saying. And here's the thing, Patrick, if I may call you that. Here's the thing. I think that we, we do a lot of, we need to recruit Black teachers. We need to recruit Black teachers. We need to go back and look at the history. When Brown versus the Board of Education happened in 1954, and it was ruled, you know, that you can't have separate but equal schools, and that we're going to start this integration movement. Remember, initially, people did not start to integrate. So it wasn't until 1957 that the integration, the real integration began to happen. And how did it happen? It happened because Black students were then pulled from their schools and put into pre predominantly well to, into white schools, not predominantly into white schools. And so what that did is that fired the Black teachers. And the black teachers couldn't get a job. And so then we started to see the teaching force just totally turn into a white, predominantly female teaching force. Now, with that being said, we have to go back and address that because there's barriers in place. There is a teacher shortage. I understand, for, especially for black teachers, but there's testing that has to take place. The testing is not, it's not relevant to black people in most cases or brown people. And so there's bias with that. There's also hurdles with just trying to financially go through a program and the money that you'll get in return and so there's structures that we would have to have a discussion on but y'all didn't come here for that but I did want to address that because that is a big issue so who's in the classroom we are in a space and I got this from the National Center of um, Educational Statistics Statistics and you'll see the demographics here if you add those numbers up more than half of the students for the first time in a long time more than half of the students are uh, students of color black and brown um, we are at a different time right now and students are coming into the classroom and they are more diverse than ever in sexual orientation, religion, gender, ability, language, socioeconomic status. It's so many different things. And so I want us to consider as educators, who have we been centering in instruction? Who have we been centering our instruction around? And I, I say we, because I'm in this with you. I am not pointing the finger, honey. They all coming over here too, because I have done that. I have centered, and I'm not trying to be funny. I have centered whiteness so much in my teaching that I was like, dang, you need to do better. And so that's why I'm posing this question to you. Who do we need to center instruction around? And so I have this thing that I always tell people, because people always ask me, because you heard my bio, I'm looking at centering Black people specifically in elementary education, because that's, I'm an elementary ed professor, but in all education. Um, if we teach Black children right, then we teach in every child right. Because if you look at academic achievement, if you look at school discipline um, rates, if you look at special education data, if you look at gifted and talented data, the Black child is always falling behind. So if we do right by them, then all other groups will be shifted up. That's just good teaching, like Dr. Gloria Lasson Billings would say. And so also I want you to think about, and this was a question that was posed to me. I went to the Institute of Teachers of Color. It was held at UC Riverside in uh, Riverside, California. And this question was posed uh, one day at breakfast. What would it mean to center diversity? What would it mean to center multiculturalism? And then I added me and Dr. Keisha Porcher. What would it mean to center blackness? And there's a lot of scholars, Justin Coles, a lot of people that write about centering blackness, Lamar Johnson. And so I started to think like, what would that mean? Like, what would that look like? And it was so hard for me to articulate what that would be and what that would look like because I've never thought about it before. And so that was the birth of really Dr. Porcher and I creating the Black Gaze. And the Black Gaze was taken from Toni Morrison. She has a book, Playing in the Dark. And she talks about what would, it, what would life be like without looking at a, out through a white gaze. And so Dr. Porcher and I created this Black Gaze because everything we wanna see is from that lens because we believe that if we see things through that lens, 
everybody's going to benefit from it. And so those are just questions that I'll ask you to, to consider. But now is the moment you've been waiting for because y'all want strategies. And so I'm excited to share some of the things I did. And let me tell you, I am not like, honey, again, this is not a checkbox. This is not like a recipe that's going to make you the best gumbo in the world. I don't know what this is going to lead you to, but at least you can walk away with something, right? And so we're going to move into co-constructing in an equity, an equitable learning environment. And so there's four guiding points that we're going to work through here. Co-constructing an equitable learning environment, we're going to talk about Centering students' knowledge and experiences, addressing biases, stereotypes, and expectations, equitable practices, and then lastly, it takes a village, okay? And so that's an African proverb, and you'll get it when we get there. So when we talk about centering students' knowledge and experience, this is a strategy, okay? Change the way that we move. And, and here's the thing. We're going from a banking concept and, and Paulo Freire talks about like teachers are depositors. You know, they put more and more into students. We need to shift from that. And we need to actually acknowledge what students are bringing into the classroom. And that means that, remember we did that identity work? That means that you gotta check yourself. And part of that is asking yourself like, who do I, who do I think brings knowledge and who, who don't I think brings knowledge, you know? Who do I give things to? Who do I have high expectations for? Everybody brings something in. And so we need to shift from being the depositor where it's my classroom. Everybody know you big bank. We know you making money. So you're the teacher. You got the power. Got it, right? Check. But we need to know, students need to know that they have a voice and you need to recognize that they bring something in the classroom. So look at yourself as a facilitator. How would that change the environment that you have created? Look at yourself as a consultant. You're giving feedback. You're, 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 you're giving questions and you're helping finesse things. Um, look at yourself as I love Dr. Christopher Emden because he has uh, all of this work on hip hop pedagogy. And he even has a book that I'm gonna pull up later, but it is for white folks in the hood and the rest of y'all. And he talks about um, being like, you know, hip hop oriented. You could be an MC, you know, the, like presiding over the class. Think about your role and how you set that up. Recognize that students are assets and students come with genius. Shout out to Dr. Goldie Muhammad, who created the book Cultivating Genius, because in that work, she talks about how she used a framework to really take the genius that Black students bring in the classroom and cultivate it. How do you use that? How do you do that kind of work? Genuinely get to know your students. Check for your preconceived judgment. Okay, so maybe I'm the only person, but you find out somebody from this side of town, you're like, eh, I don't know. Yeah, mm, mm. or you know their last name oh I remember they they cousin or they brother I went to school with they weren't that smart or okay now okay now I'm gonna get a little deeper mm, they're poor so I don't know if they're really you know that intelligent they're Latinx I don't know if they're smart they're black I don't know so those are kind of things that you need to check it, it, it just has to happen allow students to contribute what they learn and how they learn I am going to share with you what I do at my class because we co-construct class expectations, norms, rules, and consequences. I did all of that because even with the punishment, because I could be saying, I'm going to call home and talk to your mama and they could be like, I don't care, my mama ain't about to do nothing to me. So that's why I was like, well, what, what is the punishment going to be? So you have to co-construct those things, right? And so here's how, um, these are a couple of ideas that I want to share with you on how I did that. And so one of the things is literature. Oh, I cannot tell you how children's literature, even for my college students, is such an amazing tool to have, especially when you are thinking about having critical conversations. And some of y'all are going to be like, my library is lit. Like I have diverse texts. I know. But do you use them? Do you ask the right question? Do your students see themselves in the books? Like those are the questions that I really need you to have. And I promise you, one of my favorite books what is um, all are welcome here illustrations on point so amazing when we're talking about diversity but it was after the election of this year i have a second grader i have two kids a second grader and a ninth grader after the election of this year i read my second grader all because you matter because i just felt like as we were waiting for the results i felt some type of way so i knew she was feeling some type of way and so i used that book to have a conversation about why her life matters and why she is just you know, so important and into this, this society, regardless of what happens. So there's just conversations like that. In this corner, you'll see this bio poem. I have students when they come in, I dedicate at least two to three weeks. And I, and for you all, you can do more than that to getting to know my students. I do bio poems. 
I want to know everything about you. And one of the things that I pulled from Kaya Schwartz, uh, she wrote a book. I wish my teacher knew. I actually do it now if you're in teacher ed. Um, I do. I wish my professor knew. But asking him what, what you want me to know that's on, a little secret. What you want me to know? I'm not going to explain it to the whole class. It's just between me and you because what I'm, my job is to make sure that you have the best experience. So what is it? And so one of the things that I always tell people is um, I taught fourth grade. And so I will always tell people I'm going to give you an experience. OK, that's my role and my responsibility. I'm going to give you the best experience of your life, because when you get older, hopefully you ain't got to come back, because if you come back, I don't want you. OK, but if you come back like later on and you're thinking back, you can be like, dang, I was in Dr. Butcher's class and she was so amazing. I have students um, do vision boards. These are my students. And yes, I can show their photos because I have a um, don't worry about it. I can show their photos. Uh, but this is they did vision boards because I want my students to dream past just being in my space. What does life look like for you later and how you going to get there? TikTok, you got to meet these students where they are. If they on there doing these dances, honey, you better do these dances too. Now, don't make a fool of yourself now. Maybe use TikTok. I have a friend, uh, I keep talking about her because I, I just adore the work that she does with Dr. Portrait, uses TikTok to teach English lessons. Um, I use with my students, and this is an example, just a screenshot of what we did this semester, is what do you expect from me as a teacher? And what should I expect from you as a student? We create these norms. We create the way that we move. And so that's something to consider. Always, okay, stay steadfast in the work. Address bias, stereotypes, and your expectations. You got to deal with your stuff. Don't come on here talking about you don't have no biases because you do. Don't tell me you don't have stereotypes because you do. I know you do because we're human. And think about that socialization cycle. It just, it, it is. And sometimes we don't even know that we have biases, which are implicit bias until we're triggered and then we're ready to go off and we like, oh my gosh, what happened? Uh, you, had, you had some biases that you didn't know about, so address them. Another thing is this colorblind issue. Right now, more than ever, I hear people say, oh, I don't see color. I love everybody, red and yellow, black and white, everybody. I love everybody. If you don't see color, you don't see me. You don't see all this melanin. You don't. You don't see your students that are black and brown. You have to address, and I always tell people colorblindness is a form of racism because you're trying to eliminate a, a group of people. And so think about that. Specifically think about how do you see black and brown children? Particularly, how do you treat black and brown children? That'll tell you a lot about the work you have to do. We have to do better. This is not optional. Equity work and diversity work has been an add-on for so many. It can no longer be an add-on. I just showed you the numbers of who is sitting in our classroom. And even if you are in a predominantly white space, if all of the teachers in your building are white, if your administrators are white, if your students are white, if the staff is white, you still need to be having these critical conversations because we are not guaranteed to always be in a sea of whiteness. So you are going to be responsible for having these conversations with your all white class to prepare them for the diverse world that they will be entering in. So keep that at the forefront of your mind. Think about the expectations. Think about the genius. And think about the challenges, because I know this work isn't easy. That's why you, you saw all my OGs. It takes a whole community to do this work and do it effectively. And so here's some things that I want you all to, to work on. For real, I want to give you um, things to, and I see like the chat is blowing up. I'm like, oh, God, I hope they're not fussing me out. But y'all will be OK. But here's some things. Um, over the summer, y'all, it was a reading frenzy. All the racial injustice, the people was picking up Robin D'Angelo and Ibram Kendi. Now it's time to use those books. It should show up. It should, it should take form in you, and you should be able to execute the stuff that you have developed and the things that you have seen. So I want you all to do that. I want you to, to look at the books that I have here. I put Christopher Emden's on there. He does have a new book coming out in August, Ratchetemics. Um, Bettina Love's book, We Want to Do More Than Just Survive. Why are all the Black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? Classic, must read. Um, Dr. Yolanda Seeley Ruiz and Dr. Dietra uh, Price Dennis are coming out with a book that I can't wait for. It's not until May 7th, but they're taking pre orders, Advancing Racial Literacies in Teacher Education for those who are in teacher ed. Teachers, there is teaching tolerance, there's teaching for change. There's Rethinking Schools. All of these are websites 
Uh, February is coming. There's always Black Lives Matters Week at school. There's several resources on their website that I want you all to dig into. This is a recording. So if I'm moving too fast, because I don't want y'all to be dropping off on me in a second and be like, she took too long, then I want you all to be able to get um, this information. But here's another thing. The best thing ever, the best thing, like the best tool ever is Dr. Portrait and I's podcast, the Black Gays podcast. And so that's that yellow symbol that you see there. We have so many, uh, we're in our second season and our ninth episode is coming out, but we have talked to teachers, we have talked to students, we have talked to parents, we have talked to each other, we have gone through um, all of these different things. And so I want you all to definitely tune in to the Black Gays Podcast because it is an amazing resource that I use with my students. Lastly, equitable practices. Co-create a safe space, okay? And so I keep using this word, notice is always co, because you have to do it with your students. I hear so many times teachers talking about like, yes, I'm creating a safe space. If you're the only person creating the space, it's not safe. It's not safe, boo, it's not safe. So you need to co-create. That means I need to ask my students, what is it that you need from me? What is it that will make you feel safe in this, in this space? First thing is think about, and I was talking to somebody the other day and it just hit me. Think about our relationships that we have, whether you're in like a, you got a boo or you're, you're married or um, your family relationships. In order to get those relationships where they are, there's things that have to happen. There's a way that you vibe with a person, right? Trust, consistency. Those are things you, belonging. And so those are things that our students need if we're talking about a safe space. You going back to that James Baldwin, you can't just talk it. I, I don't know, the Migos just stepped in my mouth. Walk it like you talk it. Like you got to do both. They got to go hand in hand. And so think about that. Can your students see themselves in your classroom? Yeah, you can put up every um, image of people of color and all these different groups. And, you know, but are you using the image? Are you drawing in? Are you making sure that that's the vibe? Now, this is the thing, and I'm going to give y'all a secret. If you're not a rapper, don't be going in there like all my students, I'm about to become a rapper because I wanna connect with my black students. All black people don't listen to rap. I'm not gonna go into a space and start playing country music because all white people don't listen to country. So let's not use like stereotypical ways to connect, like genuinely get to know your students so that you can bring those things in the classroom. And then also understand that what you are doing pre-pandemic, it's not gonna work now. And this is honestly for you. This is, this is me talking to you from my heart to your heart. Some of us, and I say us because I'm in it, are trying to teach the way we were in brick and mortar or prior to the pandemic. We're in a pandemic. It's a whole pandemic. People dying all the time. When I was watching Biden and them, the uh, look, I like that's the homie. When I was watching President Biden and Vice President Harris last week and they were doing the memorial for the COVID victims, they said between, January, between December and January, 100,000 people died. We're not in the same type of situation. Be gracious with yourself. And I'm serious. You, you, you can't do it all. Be gracious with yourself. Shout out to all the teachers in CPS who are out there um, saying they're not going into the building. Dr. Um, Miss, I want to call him Dr. Mr. Uh, Dwayne Reed is on Twitter posting every day pictures of himself standing outside teaching because he will not go in the building. Be gracious with yourself. Care for your students. And that takes a genuine care. I love Rita Pearson and I use her at the end because she said, you're not gonna like all your students and you're not, cause I don't like all mine all the time. Not my college students, but you aren't. And, but you still, they can't know it. Like she said, they can't know it because kids don't learn from people who they know don't like them. And so you're really gonna have to learn how to build these relationships. Advocate for your students. Sometimes they don't, they don't, they don't need you to coddle them. They need to teach, you need to fight for them but also teach them how to fight. What John Lewis would talk about, good trouble. Every child deserves a champion. If you haven't seen that video, you have to watch it, but we're not watching it today because I have other things to cover. This is the last one. I said that was the last one. This is the last one. It takes a village, African proverb. Again, I started with all of my OGs. I had my granddaddy, my grandma, my mama, my daddy, my stepdaddy. I had everybody on there because I did not get here by myself. It takes a village and I'm responsible for bringing others along with me, Sankofa, okay? You have to think, you as teachers have to communicate with parents and families. Your first contact is very important. 
I used to just call parents to say, hey, my name is Miss Bertrand. Um, I'm just calling you just to say, hey, because I did not want my first contact with that parent to be something negative. It's a pandemic. Hey, how y'all doing? Y'all got food? Okay, because I know some local pantries that are open. All right, just checking in. Simple conversations. And to be honest, it'll be good for your soul because I found that doing service during these times has really been helpful for me. Make sure you also ask them the best contact. A lot of times we assume that parents do not want to be or guardians don't want to be involved in their students' lives, but they really do. They do. Maybe it's because their work schedules or other factors. And then sometimes we don't even realize it, but our environment is janky. We're not very welcoming to parents. Who wants to come into somewhere if the teacher gonna be having a little attitude or something like that? Not to say any of you will, but maybe your teacher friend is, okay? Also understand that some parents may have experienced trauma with schools. And so they still hold on to that. So there's a number of reasons. But when I talk about the best contact, I wanna rewind for a second. Sometimes it's not you calling. Sometimes it might be a text. Sometimes it might be you sliding in the DM. I get it how I live. Okay, how any way I can get it, I will get it. It takes a village. Welcome community members and organizations. I love the work uh, Dr. Porcher does on community relations um, because she looks at the assets and the conditions of communities. It's so easy for us to be judgmental. Like, I ain't going to the hood. Let me tell y'all something. My best teaching was in the hood. It wasn't until I got to the suburbs that I was like, oh my goodness, these people are crazy. Like, they helicopter moms. They want to do too many PTO means. They rolling up in my classroom with high expectations. And I'm down here just trying to survive. It was a mess. Okay. So really, let's not make those judgments. So here's the deal. We are at the end of the webinar, my friends. I'm so sad. I want to leave you with something. We want to think about these times of racial injustice, COVID-19, and um, inequities, right? And so some of this stuff isn't new. But I really want us to think about, and I'm challenging you, how will you co-create classroom spaces that center freedom, healing, and love? And so that's my challenge. I don't have the answer. I don't have the magic recipe for you, but I do know that this is work that's important for our kids and it's important for you, okay? I always tell people, um, I'm worried about our students. I am, but I'm worried about our teachers. I am, because if teachers are not well, then students can't, can't get what they need. And so I want you all to really think about what would it be like for us to co-create with our students these spaces um, that center these things. Freedom so that our kids can feel like they can just be who they are. I don't know if you noticed, but through this whole presentation, I've been using black language. A long time ago, I used to code switch like, oh, I'm not going to say this or I'm not going to say that. I can't do that no more. It's traumatic. I have to show up as my full self when I go into spaces. And I appreciate you for allowing me. The numbers have not like, oh my gosh, you're speaking black language, let me drop. So I appreciate that because I can only be me, right? What would it look like for our students to be in a space where they can be them? If they want to, if they want to come in and speak black language, they can use black language. If they want to speak their native tongue, they can use their native tongue, whatever it is. If they want to dress the way they want to dress, I love Christopher Emden because when we interviewed him for our um, podcast, he said, if they want to walk, let them walk. I mean, if it's not up there, if it's not stopping the education that's happening, let them do what they want to do. Spaces of healing. We all are hurting right now. I don't care if you're hurting because of racial injustice or you're hurting because of racial injustice and COVID. If you're hurting because you lost someone, if you're hurting because you just are tired of not being able to travel, like whatever it is. Okay, that was petty of me. But whatever it is, we're all in a need for healing and then love. I promise love is the most important thing. Like how can we build those genuine, genuine, genuine relationships with our students? Oh my gosh. I feel like Oprah, you get a thank you. You get a thank you. I can't see you, but you get a thank you. Um, here is my information. My email address is on the screen. Um, Twitter, follow me on Twitter. Okay. I, I love some good tweeting. Um, follow me on Twitter. I've been talking about the Black Gays podcast. There's our Twitter, there's our IG, there's our YouTube. We have amazing videos if you want to continue um, to, to have these conversations. Um, we've interviewed Dr. Goldie Muhammad, Dr. Yolanda Seeley Ruiz, Dr. Christopher Emden, Dr. April Baker Bell. So we've interviewed some of the top scholars in the field and that's on our YouTube page, but then also listen to us because we have really amazing conversations. Deb, I'm gonna give it to you. 
Thank you, Dr. Bertrand, for being all you. <laughs> I feel like I'm still trying to catch up though. Um, so this is fantastic. We have a few questions if you're up for um, responding to a few audience members who have been very active in the um, chat here. So I love um, it. yes, lots of kudos to you and lots of people clearly out there doing this work. Um, so that's fantastic. So thank you all for that. Um, but we do have a couple of questions that I'd like to try to get to. So you talked a lot about what you do with your students and what teachers can do with students um, in beginning or continuing this work. Um, Sherry Bettis is asking for ideas and suggestions for bringing staff together and faculty together to kind of do this work together. I actually, Sherry, have been doing quite a bit of this work recently. And so one of the things that I suggest is either bringing in someone to help guide that, but also what about a book, right? So we've talked about um, how to have these critical conversations um, with students, but the same thing applies. And I will suggest, because I've, I was talking to a group of teachers and they told me they were reading Biased. Um, and it talks about uh, racial bias, implicit bias, things of that nature. That would be a good book to start on. Another book that I would um, strongly suggest is for white folks in the hood and the rest of y'all is older. Uh, I say older because it's like four or five years old. But I think what Emden does there is he gives us this idea of um, how the experiences of black and brown students and how as teachers, um, we can begin to do work and use strategies. And it is written based off of a secondary um, so high school students, but I think it's totally applicable for all grade levels because again, it's to get the teachers to start having conversations and be reflective. Another thing, and I know like self-promotion probably is tacky, but I'm gonna promote it. Why not listen to one of the podcasts or talks and then have a conversation based off of that? I would definitely recommend for you to, all of them are dope, but um, Dr. Goldie Muhammad, we talked to her about this idea of cultivating genius for black children. And I think that was a very powerful episode, but also we talked to Dr. Christopher, M okay, I got two, two more. Christopher Emden and Dr. April Baker Bell who focused on black language, but it also hit on so many different things. And this was right the day after the, no, it was the day of the Breonna Taylor uh, situation. Um, so when the police were acquitted, so it was really a powerful conversation just to be sitting in that setting. Thank you, fantastic. Okay, another question here. I've been, this is the question asker. I've been wondering about the backlash on how to be an anti-racist in the 1776. How do you respond when questioned or called on these resources? How to be anti-racist in 1776? Is that what you said? Yeah, so someone's experiencing some backlash around these titles or these books, it sounds like. Oh, I see. Okay. So this is what I, okay, I'm sorry, y'all. I was like in seven, I guess I was thinking 1776 Declaration of Independence. I got all kind of confused, okay? But now I got it. Here's the thing about this work. And I didn't say this in this presentation because it wasn't like the, the main topic of the presentation. When you're doing this work, sometimes you're going to be operating in a space of um, isolation. And while I say build your community, my community comes from all over. It doesn't necessarily just come from ISU. And so you sometimes will do this work in a space of isolation. And so you are going to have to figure out, am I going to put my privilege on the line to do this work? Am I going to, and if I am, when people are talking about topics and I don't know if this is offensive, we have students that have been living or who have been attending schools that have been offending them since they started. And so that's something that you really are going to have to um, consider is, Am I gonna just go forth? And if it's me because I'm a disruptor, heck yeah, I'm gonna go ahead. We are gonna read how to be anti-racist because we've been reading lies since the creation of school. So that's just how I see it. That probably wasn't a gentle answer. Truth, truth though. <laughs> I don't <laughs> know how to tell it. I don't, when it comes to this work, we don't have time to tell a lie. And that's the problem. We don't have time to coddle people anymore because as you can see, Based off of 2020, based off of January 6th, there's so much work that needs to be done. And so our kids cannot afford for us to be sitting here having conversations about, I don't like this book title. I'm sorry, you don't like it, but we're going to read it. Or you don't, or you don't have to read it. And that just goes to show what kind of, you know, educator you are. 
let's squeeze in one more question before we go today. Is that all right with you? I'm fine. Fantastic. We know that students can watch traumatic videos on the internet. Mm -hmm. How do you talk to young students about what they may have seen? So I didn't put this in here, but I, okay, I'm a Google Jam fan. They actually need to pay me because I market them so much in the work that I do. And so let's just take when we first started the school year, right? I was suggesting for teachers, you could not just start the fall semester without addressing all the things that they've experienced over the summer from the COVID-19 pandemic all the way to the to the racism pandemic right and so I use Google Jam to have those critical conversations and what I do is I just pose a simple question to my students how do you feel about whatever it is how do you feel about Breonna Taylor that's the one that I did how do you feel about George Floyd how do you feel about racism how do you feel about what happened um, at the Capitol and so on Google Jam, they can share images, they can share quotes, they can share whatever they want. The thing about having these critical conversations with your students is that you have to create a conversation agreement. And I suggest courageous conversations um, about race. They have four main points for students because I don't want to silence students, but I also don't want to re-traumatize some students or I don't also want to create a space of just being offensive. Um, where people just gonna say whatever they want to say and it's just gonna be a mess. No, we gonna respect what the, the environment that we've created. And so I actually use Google Jam or what is it? Is it Jamboard or Google Jam? It's one of the two, whatever you Google and put in Jam. So Google Jamboard or Google Jam. Cause I saw it pop up on the thing, Emily, I, I saw you. But I just, had, I use that. I also use children's literacy. There's a book, um, something happened in our town the other day. I use books like that. That will that helps. That gives you um, information um, to start having these conversations. All because you matter. I use that with my second grader. So these are all different things that you can do to start to have these conversations. And you can even sometimes, I, I like the Google Jam board or Google Jam, whatever one it is. I like that because uh, it can be pictures. It's multimodal. It's how they feel. They can drop a poem on there. They can, they can record a link and put it on there of themselves just singing it out or rapping it out or this song reminding me of it so i do like that all right we're going to wrap this up in just a minute but there's one more question that's too important not to ask so do you have suggestions for any interactive training tools to help students and staff identify implicit bias i think harvard university has one and i think it's called project bias i think it's called project bias i think it's in harvard um, and that's an online bias tool. But I promise you, if you take this video, watch it again next week when they put it out there, this video will tell you where your biases lie. If you really wanna know where your biases lie, think about who you call on in the classroom, think about um, who you have low expectations for, think about who you have high expectations for. Be honest with yourself, because there's, I think that you don't need a test to tell you where your biases lie, but because they're implicit, you never know because you're triggered by them, but Harvard would offer you that. It's project implicit. Thank you. Somebody put that in the chat or they're questioning that. I don't know. Just Google Harvard University implicit bias or bias training and it, it'll come up and I think it's free. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Bertrand. And thank you participants for joining thank us today. You. We know your time is valuable and we are honored that you chose to spend this hour with us. Within a week, you'll find the recording of this webinar on the Redbird Educator Series website. We're interested in your feedback about this session and your ideas about topics for future webinars. So tomorrow, you'll receive a follow-up email um, that will include a link to a short survey. If you're interested in receiving the professional development hour for your attendance today, um, you'll find a link to the evidence of completion form at the end of that survey. We have two additional webinars this spring on Thursday, February 25th at 4 p.m. We will feature Dr. Kate Peoples from the Department of Special Education for a webinar entitled, What's the Word? Using Explicit Vocabulary Instruction to Support All Learners. And on Wednesday, April 21st at 4 p.m., you can join us for Towards Engaging in Relevant Disciplinary Literacy featuring Dr. Erin Quast from the School of Teaching and Learning. Again, thank you for spending some time with us today. Take care, and we hope to see you again soon.